Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today, I'm here with the one and only Jimmy Aiken <laughs> to talk about the conquest of Canaan. Uh, Jimmy, this is a bit of a heavy topic, but I think uh, the way you approached it on capturing Christianity was brilliant. Mm. And I saw a lot of people in the comments section saying, we want to hear Jimmy's perspective. You kind of alluded to it in the presentation, but they wanted to really hear you flesh it out. And so I'm more than happy to give you the platform. Yeah, well, I'm happy to be here and, you know, always happy to do whatever I can to help folks. Well, Jimmy, I guess, um, is there anything you want to say before we get started? Nope. Okay, then let's just first begin with um, some of the possible approaches or interpretations that one can have regarding the conquest of Canaan. You mentioned these three during uh, your interview on Caption Christianity. Yeah, so um, just I guess to kind of set the stage for folks, um, what we're talking about is certain passages in the Old Testament where um, that are associated with the, the entrance of the Israelites into the Promised Land, which was known as Canaan and was already inhabited by people known as Canaanites. And um, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, and in particular in Genesis, it talks about how the Canaanites um, were committing great moral crimes, you know, things like child sacrifice and so forth. And this is fleshed out a little bit in the, the other four books of the Pentateuch, where it talks about various Canaanite practices and uh, tell, Moses tells the Israelites on God's behalf that they're to repudiate these practices, they're not to engage in them, and they are abominable. And, um, and then in preparing the Israelites to, to go into Canaan at the end of the Exodus experience in Deuteronomy, um, God in a few passages uses languages, uses language that seems to command the extermination of the Canaanites, not simply um, f defeating them militarily, but but wiping them out to in, not just the the adult fighting men, but the women, the children. Just get rid of the Canaanites, and then we have uh, in in the follow on to the Pentateuch in the book of Joshua, where they actually go into the land. Uh, we have a repetition of some of this language. There is a particular um, custom in the ancient world known in Hebrew as harem which is often translated into English as the ban. And so if you put someone under harem or under the ban, it was a sort of religious act where you would um, effectively exterminate whatever it is that's under the ban as a kind of act of faith. And so we, we have some of this language. Sometimes harem, the term, is present. Sometimes it's not. But basically, these passages are very disturbing to modern sensibilities. And, you know, we live in a century it, within the last hundred years. There have been multiple cases of genocide attempts to exterminate different people, the most famous being the, ironically, the attempted extermination of the Jewish people themselves by the Nazis in the 20th century. And um, as a result, we live in an age where people have a strong emotional reaction against this kind of language. And critics of Christianity, including atheists, will, will and, and biblical religion in general, you know, like Richard Dawkins and so forth, they'll point to this, to these passages, and say, how can you possibly explain this? Well, that's not a new question because Christians, you know, from the beginning have been taught, beginning with our Lord, a love your neighbor as yourself ethic. And so it has been a question, what do we make of these passages? That's been a question throughout, throughout Christian history. And you find very early Christian authors, uh, like, for example, the early Christian writer Origen, wrestling with these passages and saying, how do we understand them? And basically, classically, there have been two approaches that, um, that have been, well, originally there were sort of two approaches. They've modified somewhat and become three. The original two approaches were to, the first one was to take a literalist approach and say these, these passages mean exactly what they seem to mean, 
on first reading, and God really did command the Israelites to, in some cases, exterminate the Canaanites to the last person. And for one reason or another, that was okay. Um, and then the question would be, how can you how can you justify that? How can you say why it's okay? And you had thinkers like, for example, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who would say, well, um, God has the right to determine how much life a person receives, and even though we are not under ordinary circumstances permitted to take innocent human life, God has rights that we don't, and therefore God can intervene to suspend uh, what normally we would be able to do, and he can authorize us. If he tells us to take a life, then it's okay because we're not doing that on our own authority. We don't have the right to determine that an innocent is to die, but God does. And therefore, um, if God tells you to take an innocent life, then you could do that. Um, there are more refined ways of saying that. I would say it a bit differently today, but I'm trying to mirror the kind of language that Aquinas would have used. I would put it a little differently myself if I were defending that position. The other early position that you had that was, um, for example, advocated by Origen was to essentially spiritualize these passages. And in doing that, he advocates of this position would say, well, really what these passages are, are meant to do is not teach us anything about history, but to teach us a spiritual lesson. Um, so we can kind of set aside what the human author was intending to do and just look at the spiritual lesson that God has for us in these texts. And, um, and that would be something like have nothing to do with paganism, you know, get rid of the paganism, set it aside, do whatever it takes. Um, kind of like when Jesus says in the Gospels, uh, you know, if, you're, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better to enter into heaven maimed or, you know, without a hand or an eye than it is to go to hell. And so Christian scholars down throughout the ages have recognized that as an example of hyperbole, that Jesus doesn't literally mean cut off your hand if you sin with your hand, or pluck out your eye if you look too long at an attractive woman. This is hyperbole. It really just means do whatever you have to to deal with sin. Um, but the key thing about this spiritualizing interpretation is it essentially ignores the literal interpretation of the text, which is what the human author is trying to do. And for that reason, the um, as, as later Christian authors, like Aquinas, uh, retrieved the importance of the literal sense of the text. You need to take account, this doesn't mean reading everything literalistically, but you do need to take serious account of what the human author of the text is trying to communicate to his audience. That's the literal sense of the text, and that's the foundation of any other senses. So you can't just ignore the literal sense of the text and leap to a spiritualized interpretation. You have to take what the human author is trying to do seriously. Um, and so that um, led to a kind of modification, which is one of the three theories that we have today that are common. Uh, the first theory is still the literal one that says these mean what they say, and it's okay because God has rights we don't. The second is a modified understanding that says actually if you look at what the human author was doing, he, he, he was doing something much more like the spiritual interpretation than was at first obvious. The literal sense of the text really is not kill these kill these Canaanites, but instead the literal sense really is have nothing to do with paganism. And it, that's just expressed hyperbolically, the way Jesus uses hyperbole when he says, cut off your hand or pluck out your eye in order to deal with sin. 
Jesus doesn't mean that literalistically, but the literal sense of what Jesus says is is something like, do whatever it takes to deal with sin. And in the same way, um, the, the second proposal in its modified form, which is not pure spiritualism anymore because it's trying to incorporate the literal sense of the text, says the literal sense of the text is... Um, have nothing to do with paganism. That's really what's being said here. That's what the human author of the text is trying to communicate to his audience. Then more recently, now one of the classic assumptions in Christianity has always been that the uh, that the texts of the Bible individually are divinely inspired in such a way that you can take a particular text, if you can figure out its meaning, it's going to be guaranteed to be true. But more recently, there have been alternatives proposed that have said, well, maybe we don't need to be biblical inerrantists. You know, like C.S. Lewis was someone who was not a full biblical inerrantist. Um, Or maybe biblical inerrancy works in a different way than we've historically assumed. And actually, as we can get into this, um, Pope Benedict actually made comments that move seem to move in that direction. But as a result of this reevaluation of the issue of biblical inerrancy, there have been there's been sort of a third position open up, which would be um, that th- the Bible contains passages where the author is expressing the human author is expressing a view that is in fact incorrect that the human author is saying something that is mistaken, and that ha- that applies to these passages, um, that God didn't really command this, and the idea that God did command this stuff is, is simply mistaken. The human author was a creature of his times. He thought the way ancient Israelites thought, and so he, believe, he may have believed that God was commanding all this, but that's not actually true. And in order to figure out what the real truth is, we need to incorporate the revelation of Jesus Christ, which has, you know, love God and love your neighbor as the two highest commandments. And so we can only understand the um, these d- disturbing passages in the Old Testament in the light of Jesus Christ and what he would have us say. And so you need to use Jesus Christ as a kind of corrective to the erroneous viewpoints that some of the Old Testament authors may have had. And so looked at one way, you could say, well, that's a kind of that's a kind of errantism, you know, it doesn't uphold the full er inerrancy of Scripture, looked at another way, and this is more the way Pope Benedict would seem to articulate things, um, where the inspiration of Scripture lies is not in the individual words of a text. You have to discern the—you have to take texts in the overall context of the Bible, including Jesus Christ, to figure out their ultimate meaning. And so, Pope Benedict would say the text is inerrant, but inerrancy doesn't operate on the verbal level. Instead, it operates on the level of the entirety of God's revelation. When you take it as a whole, it is inerrant. Yeah, just to chime in, chime in a little bit, Jimmy, mm-hmm. and just for the audience too, when I'm nodding my head, I'm nodding that I'm understanding, not mm-hmm. necessarily agreeing. Right? Yeah. So, uh, Jimmy, um, so it seems like there are three perspectives that are on offer or at least three, right? So the Today, first is, yeah. right, you take the literal view that, you know, something like this, or basically what the text says happened mm-hmm. uh, from a first glance, or just like a kind of natural reading, I suppose. Uh, the second is a kind of, well, obviously, as you said, a spiritual reading where the biblical author wasn't actually intending to assert this as literal historical evidence. yeah now I'd push yeah. back a little bit there because that's the the original what you had with some early Christian writers like Origen was a pure spiritualizing of the text that ignored the literal sense and just didn't deal with it the more modern version is not a pure spiritualizing approach it is not a spiritualizing approach because what it's trying to do is understand what the human author's intent was. And the human author's intent was not to say God literally commanded this. Sure. So I would kind of summarize the three positions this way. The first one would say God really did command Canaanite extermination, and it's okay. 
The second position would be God didn't literally command Canaanite extermination, and the human author knew that, or at least wasn't claiming that God literally commanded this. Mm -hmm. And then the third is God did not command it, but the human author did not understand that, but we do understand it now in the light of Christ. Mm. Yeah, and so just to be clear before we continue, at least mm -hmm. the first two readings arguably could still, I mean, obviously the first one, but the second one could still be compatible with inerrancy if one holds to inerrancy. In the classical form. Sure. And the third one is compatible with inerrancy if you relocate inspiration to apply to the entirety of God's revelation rather than to the individual words of a passage. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then there are, but then of course with that third one, you could understand it in a way that allows for errancy. Yeah. You could have, a, you can, you can have a restricted inerrancy that uh, just says this, this, these moral claims in the old Testament are wrong, but you, that would be, if you say that, then you are deviating from the more historic Christian understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it almost sounds like you could actually articulate four, but like it's like the third one mm -hmm. can split into two, right? So there, there's a lot of I guess oh, nuances. Oh, or here. or five if you want to split the second right. one into two. Right, right, right. And then even I know some people who take kind of a skeptical theist approach, and they say I don't know, but mm -hmm. I trust God, and so we'll just I'll walk with God on this issue. So I mean, there's there's a yeah. I, I would with, yeah. I, I would say that's not really a position. That's not an explanation. That's just right. a that's that's agnosticism on what right. the, on what these passages mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So then, mm -hmm. at least what we're talking about are people who are actually saying something about the text rather than kind of being hands off with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if that makes sense. Okay. So, Jimmy, before we continue, I just want to ask you too. What do you think about going to the first perspective? William Lane Craig's use of divine command theory here. I know that you had some mm -hmm. comments, and I was just interested to have you flesh those out more. Yeah, so um, so I had a few thoughts. Now, so just again for context, this came up because uh, Bill Craig did an interview with Alex O'Connor in which Alex O'Connor asked him about this. Uh, apparently, this goes back to a feud between Richard Dawkins and Bill Craig, where um, Dawkins has been challenged to debate Craig, and he's said he's not interested in doing that. And over time, he's offered different reasons for why he's not interested. And most recently, he's apparently said, well, I would never debate Bill Craig because he's a genocide defender, and that's just off the table for me. And that's that's a BS excuse. He's he's making excuses there. Um, you know, I for reasons we don't have to take time to go into right now. But that's a nonsense excuse. That's just that's not the real reason he doesn't want to debate Bill Craig. However, um, then Alex O'Connor, because Dawkins had said this on O'Connor's show. O'Connor then invited Bill Craig on to respond, and they talked about this. And it and in this, um, Bill Craig essentially defended the first of the three positions. And um, in terms of how he did in that, I think he could have done it better. Um, he, in a couple of respects, one respect was the way he phrased things in terms of God's rights. Now, actually here, he's following the way Christians have traditionally expressed this, uh, including people like Aquinas. They'll talk about God as a king, and he's got these rights, and so if he says it's okay to do, then it's okay to do. Um, I have found that it, modern people respond to a different language. Uh, it's not factually different, but it it helps them get over the conceptual hurdle if you say it like this. All life is a gift from God. So instead of talking about God's right to take a life, I'm talking, I'm putting the emphasis elsewhere and noting it's all a gift. You know, he didn't have to create us. He didn't have to give us life. All life is a gift. And therefore, it's up to God as the giver of that gift to determine how much physical life a person is going to receive. Now, in fact, he's given all of us everlasting life. 
So he's given all of us, and 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 in fact, given the fact we're going to be resurrected, there's an infinite amount of physical life for us in the future. But it's up to him to determine how much of our initial physical life, how long that lasts. It's We don't have a right to any particular amount. And so it's up to him to determine how long our initial physical lives are, how much of the gift of physical life he gives us at this phase of our existence. And he can therefore determine the circumstances in which it is in, in which one expires. And if he chooses to uh, authorize the Israelites to end the lives of various people, this is just the mechanism by which he is he is determining the end of how much of this gift of life they are receiving. And I find that explaining it that way helps various individuals get over the hump of this of this conceptually because they're not thinking of it in terms of God as a human king or dictator who is issuing orders so much as they're recognizing, oh, wait, actually everything I've got is a gift from God. And it's easier to understand, well, of course, how, how big the gift is, is that's up to God. I don't have a right to a bigger gift than what I receive. And so I find that helps that way of framing the issue can help modern people. So I think Bill Craig, even though he's following an established tradition in terms of talking about God having the right to do these things, I think the gift language is actually more helpful for moderns when articulating the first position. The second thing that I would say about how he did, he um, he confessed himself to be a divine command theorist, believing that the way he articulated, he said, you know, morality is grounded in God's nature. And then it's communicated to us through divine commands that do have to be consistent with God's nature. Um, But he still seemed to leave a lot of freedom for God. Now, I would agree that Morality is rooted in God's nature. You know, God is love, and love is is the essence of morality. Um, and there are things that we are morally obligated to do that flow from divine commands rather than just nature, whether divine or human. Uh, for example, getting baptized. You know, God that was a choice. He could have he could have had us, you know, redeemed in some other way under ordinary circumstances than by getting baptized. But he chose baptism. And so that's the way in which we are incorporated into the love of God. Um, So I think there are some examples where you you can only appeal to a divine command. You can't appeal to divine nature or human nature as this requires baptism because God could have done it another way. Um, But um, Craig seemed to have a much more expansive understanding of what God could do as if his own nature, as if most moral commands didn't flow from a combination of divine and human nature, and God could just command anything. And I think that's mistaken. Um, I think that most moral commands are rooted in the love ethic that is in divine nature, but they're also rooted in human nature in terms of how do humans interact with love and express love. And that's something that varies from different between different species. You know, um, if you're a human, well, okay, given the facts of human biology, you know, we have we bear these offspring that have ginormous heads that have to fit through a woman's pelvis. And that means human offspring are born incredibly uh, weak and defenseless compared to those of other creatures. They're much more immature. You know, if you look at a deer and a deer gives birth, if you watch nature documentaries, you'll see the young deer, the fawn, within an hour or so, it's up and running around. Well, it takes human babies a couple of years to get to the point they can get, they can, you know, stand up and run around confidently. And it takes two decades for a human, a human child to mature 
and become an adult. And since children need care while they're immature, that means their parents need to stay together for decades. You know, we're not like fish where, you know, the female lays the eggs and the male fertilizes them and then they swim off. With humans, the parents need to stick together for decades in order to successfully raise offspring. And that means we need marriage. And so marriage is something that falls out of human nature as a way to express love for each other and for the children and for, in a broader sense, for society. So um, I think that most moral commandments are in this category. They, they aren't just divine fiats like baptism. Instead, they are something that human nature determines how we are meant to express our love, which is rooted in divine nature. And I don't think that Craig came across with that kind of an understanding. He seemed to think God could command almost anything, and, and, and somehow it would still be reconcilable with the idea that God is loving. And I, I thought that there were legitimate grounds for criticism of what Craig said there. Yeah, if I can just jump in, Jimmy, mm-hmm. and also, how's my volume? Is it okay? It's a little loud, but it's it's certainly not hard to hear. Okay, let me fix that just real quick. How's this? Is it better? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to keep it here. Yeah, there were some uh, apparently audio issues, and I've tried to fix that, so hopefully that's better. So, Jimmy, the way that I see it, you know, I guess in, in one way, like, when we look at the Euthyphro dilemma, you know, mm-hmm. this question on does God command something because it's good? Or is it simply good because God commands it? Mm-hmm. And the question here is, is there like an independent standard from God by which he's trying to abide? Whereas classically, you want to say that it is precisely God himself who is the good. And so, you know, the commands that flow out from him aren't, let's say, arbitrary. They're from his nature. Mm-hmm. But there's always been this question that people have raised, like, okay, um, let's say you solve the youth by saying that God will command things that are in accordance with his nature because he is goodness. Sorry, it looks like we lost connection for a bit. Oh, you froze for a minute. Yeah. It's just a buffering issue. Yeah, well, I was basically talking about the Euthyphro dilemma. Mm -hmm. And I know that when Craig has said that one of the ways he deals with the problem is by saying that God's nature is the good, Mm -hmm. uh, what ends up happening is some people will say, okay, then let's run with that. And does that mean God, isn't there this problem of, let's, let's say, arbitrariness? where God could maybe just command anything, oh, but because his nature is good, it's it's okay. So, you know, think of any, let's say, morally apparently absurd scenario. But because you've already said God's good, that kind of gives him, I don't know, the, the trump card for anything at that point. And then there's this question, and then what's the meaning of goodness? Or like, mm-hmm. what, you know, is how can we really know then? Is it, it just, does, does good become just anything God will? So anyway, um, I, I mention all of this because It sounds like to me that, you know, the way that Craig deals with the problem of the Euthyphro dilemma, perhaps it works in that particular case for human morality. But then the question then becomes on divine morality, you know, what, I mean, you can call it like perfect being ethics. What is the, I think you mentioned this in the interview, what is the divine natural law? Mm-hmm. Can we say things about the divine nature where God would not command, for example, that I can go and torture children for fun because he dem- because he's issued a divine command? Could I actually say, oh, actually, you know, this isn't a divine command, or I can tell based on the nature of the command that this isn't the source, uh, that God isn't mm-hmm. the source of the command? I mean, I mean, it seems like you'd want to be able to say those kinds of checks and balances. Yeah, and this is something I pointed out on, I believe, on uh, Capturing Christianity, is, you know, Abraham, you know, when dealing with the Sodom and Gomorrah issue, Abraham turns to God and is tr- hoping to negotiate him down from, I'm just going to wipe out these cities, to, well, if I can find a certain number of righteous people there, then I'll, I'll tolerate the wicked for the sake of the righteous, and um, and Ab- Abraham in in you know pressing this point home in Genesis, he acknowledges God is the judge of the earth, and he says, "Will not the judge of the earth do right?" You know, you don't destroy the righteous with the wicked, and so I think that it is possible to look at various moral intuitions that we have and say, "Yeah, God couldn't command that," um, just like Abraham. 
correctly understood God could not could not simply destroy all the righteous with the wicked. And so um, I think that although we have to be very careful and we have to think in a sophisticated way about exactly what is the nature of the moral act that's being proposed in a given circumstance, I think it is possible to look at at least certain basic core intuitions and exclude them from things that God could actually command. Yeah, and I'll just say very quick before we move on to the next question, this was actually something that I wanted to do originally in my undergrad, mm -hmm. look into uh, a divine theory of ethics uh, mm -hmm. and see like what, what, what are certain things that we would know based on the fact that God is the good itself or being itself or ipsum, es uh, ipsum esse subsistence. You know, what are some things that we can say would be po impossible for him to command given his nature? So I think that the other approach of just saying he could just command anything willy nilly, that also is kind of an extreme from mm -hmm. what I can tell. I think we want to say something maybe closer to the middle or somewhere in between, right? Yeah. Now, in, mm -hmm. in trying to steel man Craig's position, um, I think that Craig would agree that God can't just command anything because he, he acknowledges that God's own nature is the standard, ultimately. Um, and so I think Craig would agree that God can't just command anything. But what I would say is I don't know that he has a coherent account of exactly what God could and could not command. Um, it, but then I haven't fully fleshed that out either. So I could be open to the same charge. But my sense is that Craig is much more flexible about what he think, thinks God could command compared to what most people would think God could command. Yeah, Jimmy, I 100% I appreciate that clarification because I think that's what I was trying to get at. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I've been, I was kind of going in a, about it in a roundabout way. Mm. But yeah, there, there, there is this question on... I think Craig, yeah, wants to say that because, yeah, of course he's not going to want to say that God can just command things willy-nilly. Uh, he wants to say that because God is the good and his nature is such that, you know, his commands follow from his nature, right? And that means something because he's good, mm -hmm. because he's love. Uh, because, yeah, I think he holds to this exemplar theory that God, like, exemplifies the good and, and yeah. so on and so forth. And, and to um, give an illustration of how Craig might attempt to flesh it out how how this is upholding the good in these situations. Um, and there are little snatches of this in his interview, but um, he could say, well, look, uh, the Canaanites were engaged in horrible evil practices, and uh, the, can the uh, Canaanites who were old enough to be responsible for them, for these actions, were um, ending them that well that promoted the good you know because it ended these practices or would have ended these practices if the Israelites had carried these instructions out thoroughly in the land on the other hand even for and this is something he actually did say or pretty close to what he did say those Canaanites who were young enough that they were not responsible for the practices of their culture they they got good too because they got taken out of that horrible evil environment that would have corrupted them when they grew up and they got to go to heaven on on Craig's view and the Israelites they also were uh, were the good was promoted for them because if they had carried or would have been promoted for them because if they carried out these commands then they wouldn't have been tempted to imitate Canaanite pagan practices later, and their history would have been different. They wouldn't have had things like the Babylonian exile, for example. And so really, on Craig's view, under this first option, um, this was an attempt to promote the good, both for the Canaanites and for the Israelites. Okay, Jimmy, uh, I want to get now to uh, one last question, and then we'll get into your perspective. Mm -hmm. So... I know that one popular alternative to the literal interpretation, or at least, well, this the people of this camp would consider themselves to be also within the literal vein of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But some people think that every time it says, you know, for example, utterly destroy them, mm -hmm. or it says that they in fact did kill every, well, put everything to the sword, everything that breathed, basically, mm -hmm. every living thing. And then you later see in the text, okay, they're alive, or there's some Canaanites still around, some people will then say, oh, well, then we need to interpret this kind of language of massacre, utter massacre, indiscriminate massacre, 
as hyperbolic. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a possible interpretation, or what are your thoughts on maybe yeah. the problems with that view? Oh, no, it's clear when you read ancient Near Eastern literature, not just in Israel, but outside of Israel, um, that they used hyperbole in talking about battles. And they would say, like, go exterminate them to the last man. And that was hyperbole. Or looking back on a battle, we exterminated them to the last man. And that was hyperbole. You see this, for example, in um, Egyptian literature, and it's not confined to Egyptian literature, but you see it in Egyptian literature, for example, in a mo- in, a, in an artifact known as the Merneptah Stella. Uh, Merneptah was one of the pharaohs after Ramesses the Great, shortly after Ramesses the Great, and he did battle. He, he invaded um, the Levant, which is the area connecting Africa to Europe. It's where Israel is. And he invaded uh, that area and and kicked butt, you know, which was actually one of Pharaoh's jobs. Um, what Pharaohs would do is they would... Uh, Rather than build stuff at home in Egypt, they would go conquer somebody and take all their stuff. That was that was you're expected to do that if you were Pharaoh. They were kind of like the go old. They didn't make stuff themselves all the time. They would just acquire it from others. And so Merneptah has you know been being a good Pharaoh. He's he's attacked a foreign land to get their stuff. And he um, puts up a monument, which pharaohs do, uh, to commemorate how great he is. And he names the different people that, um, that he's conquered on this military expedition, the people he's fought battles with and beaten. And he uses hyperbolic language. When he gets down to Israel, and this is like the actual first mention of Israel, in the archaeological record, when Renepta gets down to Israel, he says, Israel's seed is not... Well, that would mean you killed all the Israelites, including their children. But that clearly didn't happen. He didn't exterminate Israel, but he's using exterminatory language about Israel. And we see the same thing in Scripture, where we have exterminatory language used in some passages. um, But then it turns out, well, no, there's still Canaanites or different subgroups of Canaanites that we have been told were were the objects of being placed under the ban, like the Amalekites. And then it turns out, oops, there's still some Amalekites later. So we obviously have some typical ancient Near Eastern hyperbole at work here in the text. Right. I I suppose that, at least personally for me, just to express some of my opinion, Mm -hmm. whenever you have hyperbole, it's typically because there's a truth that's being Mm -hmm. stretched, right? So, for example, like if you say... I would say a truth being emphasized. Okay, emphasized. But for mm-hmm. example, if you say like, um, we, you know, that, I don't know, the Chiefs totally slaughtered, mm-hmm. I forget what the other team was actually this year's Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the Chiefs totally slaughtered the other team, right? Well, the underlying truth is that the Chiefs won. Yeah. They, they had a very resounding victory, although it was actually much closer. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, but the the language, I guess, is just emphasizing the utter nature of the victory and the defeat of the other side. Mm -hmm. using like violent language but obviously not meant to be taken fully literally right but i I suppose jimmy um i think for me at least the problem is that when the text really does go out of its way to make it look as if women and children were in fact killed Mm -hmm. i'm kind of wondering like does the text really allow you to be hyperbolic about these things like maybe maybe they didn't kill every man woman and child but can't you say some yeah, so I think that the, I th- I, so here's where we're kind of bridging into the second of yeah. the t- of the two uh, major options today, and this is the one that I prefer. Um, this is my prefer. I mean, I'll mention all three of them to people and let them make up their own mind about what they what they how they want to take these texts. But this is actually this happens to be the one I prefer, and so. The way I would articulate it, I would say, okay, the first thing we have to do in figuring out what the human author is trying to do is situate the text in its historical context. Now, texts like um, the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then Joshua, which was written in the same basic time period as Deuteronomy— because it's, it, it sinks into the same book, it's got the same outlook and so forth. So they're all basically written within the same, the same time window. We need to figure out when that is. Now, if these were really written by Moses 
and his immediate successors, then that would tend to favor the literal interpretation that we've already discussed, because these would have been commands that were actually given to the Israelites as they were coming into the Promised Land. But in fact, most scholars have concluded that these, even though they may have elements in them that go back to Moses, they weren't actually written by him. And in fact, they never claim to be written by him. You know, if you if you read them, there are various, in, I mean, they never say Moses wrote this whole book. Um, it may say Moses said this or Moses wrote that, but it's an individual passage. It's not the whole book. The whole book never claims to be written by Moses. And there are indications that it was written later. Um, not only, one of the most famous is probably Moses's death at the end of Deuteronomy, where it says, you know, he died uh, without coming into the Holy Land and no one knows on this mountain and no one knows where his tomb is to this day. God you know, buried him or whatever. And, um, well, obviously people have said, well, Mo it doesn't look like Moses wrote that because it's talking about stuff after he died. Well, you'll also notice it says to this day, and that's not the only place in the Pentateuch where you find that phrase. There are various other passages that also talk about how things have, are still the same way to this day, suggesting they were written sometime after the event that you're reading about in the Pentateuch. And so the question is then, well, when would these have been written? Now, m m the majority opinion among modern scholars is that they weren't written until quite some centuries later. Uh, it'll vary depending on the on the source theory that the author is proposing, but they'll say that the elements that are now the Pentateuch got written sometime between the 800s BC and like the 500s or 400s BC, after the Babylonian exile. That's not my position. Um, I would say that the best evidence suggests these were written about 1000 BC, around the time of the United Monarchy, particularly the time of David and Solomon. And so uh, even so I tend to date them earlier than most scholars do, but it's still not the Exodus generation. And so if it, on either of these views, whether you have like my earlier dating or the more common scholarly dating, these are written hundreds of years after the events in question. And so you have to ask, well, what is the historical author trying to communicate to the audience that he's writing for? Is he trying to communicate that God literally said, wipe them out, all of them, including the kids? Or is he more concerned with communicating to the audience, have nothing to do with paganism? Well, I think the latter is quite arguable. I think that's the primary, the author's primary concern in these texts is he's wanting to inoculate his own generation against making compromises with paganism. And the way he's doing that is by depicting um, God as giving very harsh exceptionalist uh, instructions to an earlier generation about how to deal with pagans. Um, so, so that's a kind of a general sketch of this. And I would note that this position is actually the one that's endorsed by the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Um, back in 2008, uh, Pope Benedict had a synod on the Word of God. And one of the things that came out of that synod was uh, a request for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith to undertake a study of the inspiration and truth of sacred scripture. And so what they did, what the CDF did, is they tasked the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which is not actually part of the magisterium, but it's an advisory body of scholars that's run by the CDF. In fact, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was also the head of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. And the Pontifical Biblical Commission's documents can only be published if the magisterium approves them. And so they they tasked the Pontifical Biblical Commission with writing a document on the on the uh, on the inerrant on the inspiration and truth of sacred scripture. It's called the inspiration and truth of sacred scripture. And it deals with these passages. It has a whole section 
on violence in the Old Testament. And within that, it has a section on the ban, harem, the concept we've been talking about. And it essentially makes the same points I've been making. It says these texts were written long after uh, the events that the text is describing, and they should not be taken as literal accounts of history, but as a kind of stylized version of history to teach a later generation of Israelites moral messages like have nothing to do with paganism. So um, this isn't just a theory that is held by Jimmy Aiken. This is a theory that is held by other scholars and, in fact, is endorsed by the scholars on the Pontifical Biblical Commission. So I'm not sure if I answered every aspect of your question there, but if I didn't, you can let me know, and I'll have another bite at the apple. No, you're good. So mm-hmm. I think— um, that, uh, Sorry, apple-bobbing reference, not Genesis reference. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Good to clarify, uh, mm-hmm. Jimmy. So we kind of got into the next question, which is totally fine, because mm-hmm. you mentioned what your preferred approach is, and so let me just try to, try to summarize what you said and ensure mm-hmm. that I've understood what you're saying, and then let me know if I missed anything. So you take the um, spiritual reading, in that you think no, okay. I I I'm taking a historical reading of the literal sense of the text i'm i'm saying that the literal sense uh, that the author was tr- of what the author was trying to communicate was not exterminate the canaanites to a person it was the literal sense the message he's trying to communicate to his au- to his audience mm-hmm. is have nothing to do with paganism um so I guess I, I might have then misunderstood what you meant by the modified spiritual reading. I didn't use that phrase. This is not a spiritual reading. Okay. Spiritual readings ignore the literal sense of the text. That's the big criticism of the spiritualized readings you find in the Church Fathers, is they, mm-hmm. they're, they're ignoring the literal sense. I am not ignoring the literal sense. I'm trying to establish the literal sense, and I'm saying that the literal sense— it, is something different than what you would think if you read this as a modern person take without reference to its historical context. Okay, I think I, I think I misunderstood something you said when you said the second approach. Mm-hmm. This think. is a modified version of the second approach. Yeah. And the second approach was the spiritual reading. But... Yes. Yeah. Oh, so okay. so th- so what I'm doing is regrounding. So right. the conclusion I would say that this is teaching a spiritual lesson is correct. Right. But I'm regrounding it in the literal sense of the text instead of simply yeah. ignoring the literal sense of the text. Cuz yeah, and what you're saying is the author himself is not necessarily saying um that Kill them all. The author is trying to communicate a spiritual point. Yeah. And if you look at the letter and the historical context of the uh, text, so to speak, that is, it, it becomes apparent that that's what he's doing. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, so then, yeah. You, yeah. Taking, he's he, he's right. not literally giving um, instructions to kill Canaanites because he's not talking to that generation. He's talking to his own generation, and his own generation was not in a position. They were already in the land. You know, these were all, whatever happened with the Canaanites, that's in the past. Um, The Pontifical Biblical Commission even argues that um, the Canaanite groups were no longer identifiable at the time these texts were written. I'm not fully persuaded of that, but it's going to depend on the dating you use, among other things. But, um, But I think the point is accurate that the author of the texts was not literally giving instructions to a generation that was already dead. He's 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 trying to communicate in his own day to his own audience. And I think that um mm-hmm. the understanding of have nothing to do with paganism is the most plausible understanding uh or at least arguably it's the most plausible understanding of these just wipe out pagans texts that can't actually be applied by his modern audience. Yeah, and I just want to apologize, Jimmy, mm-hmm. because when you said modified second, I thought, okay, modified spiritual. But yeah. you're like doing your own thing with the second reading itself, right? You're modifying it in a very distinct way that is still taking into account the literal historical meaning and context. So I yeah, just want to be clear. Though, yeah, though it's, it's not just me. It's also like all the scholars on the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Right. 
And so I wanted, I mean, that's something I wanted to get into, but mm -hmm. let me, let me just first ask you kind of these three sub questions. And I sure. know that you've talked about these, but I just want to make it real clear for the audience. Mm -hmm. So just first really quick, um, what does the archeological data suggest about the conquest of Canaan? This is disputed. Um, there are a, there's a range of opinions in biblical archaeology, and there are sort of three groups. There are the biblical minimalists who think that almost nothing, I mean, these people would even like question the existence of King David. They would think almost nothing in, in the Old Testament is historically reliable until maybe the very end. Then there are the biblical maximalists who would say, no, this is a fundamentally accurate record. And then there are people who are kind of in the middle. So when you, when you look at the, um, at the questions about the coming into Canaan, there are a lot of scholars, including non-Christian ones, who will say, yeah, there was, we have some evidence for, for, um, for the Exodus. It, it looks like this really happened. And in fact, I have used an argument um, that, to my knowledge, I've somewhat pioneered of using the criterion of embarrassment to argue for the reality of the ex of the actually this is to for the reality of the Exodus, um, because when you look at national origin stories for different people, if they've been around in a land for a long time they tend to say things like, oh, we've always been here, or, you know, the gods put us here, or something like that. You don't say, we were uh, slaves until recently, and then we escaped and came here. You know, that's not a glorifying thing to say. It's glorifying your ancestors to say, oh, the gods put us here. It is not glorifying your ancestors to say, we were a subjugated people who escaped. And so that, since you will tend to be honest when you say something embarrassing about yourself as opposed to something glorifying yourself. Um, the criterion of embarrassment, which is often used in biblical studies, would suggest the Exodus is a real event. The, this is not the kind of story you would make up about your ancestors. And so for that and other things like the Merneptostella, which has some it I won't go into the details, but the linguistics in the in the Merneptus Stella that I mentioned earlier um, speak of Israel as if it is not yet a settled people. It, it's not yet a people that has an established territory. It's still roaming around. Um, and uh, so I think with all that, we actually have good evidence the Exodus occurred. And I actually have an episode of Mysterious World about that, if, you, if people want to check that out. Um, but when it comes to specific things that we read, like in the book of Joshua, like, for example, the conquest of, of, of Jericho and Ai, two of the big towns, that they go after. Um, well, we don't have evidence of Jericho's walls falling down. Jericho is believed to be actually the oldest city in world history. And it's, it, it, you know, we have done a lot of archeological work there. We don't have evidence of its walls literally falling down in the right time frame. Um, that's another thing that may be hyperbole. Uh, as the Pontifical Biblical Commission suggests it is. Um, when it comes to AI, which they then conquer, there's a dispute. Uh, AI is a real place, but um, but we don't find it, at least at the site that is normally thought to be AI, um, we don't find evidence of an invasion in the right time period. In fact, it even looks like AI was in ruins during this time period. And in fact, that's actually what the name AI means is ruins. Um, and so the a, a common proposal in archaeology is that, yeah, there was a city here, it got ruined, they built a new city on top of it, and they called the new city ruins because of the ruins that were there. But there doesn't seem to be evidence of an Israelite in a uh, conquest of this city in the right time frame. Now, there is an alternative theory that's been proposed, but so far I only know of one guy who advocates it, but it's we've misidentified the site of AI, and AI is really a different site. So to kind of sum all that up, um, we do have evidence 
that the Israelites moved into the Holy Land, but we have a harder time establishing archaeological arguments for the details of exactly how they entered the Promised Land from the book of Joshua. All right, uh, Jimmy, another question mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about is uh, the Church Fathers. So mm -hmm. you noted that the traditional interpretation would be something like the first position, which is, you know, the very, like, uh, which is a particular form of the literal. Yeah, yeah. God you, said it's it's what you, and part of the problem is the term literal can mean yeah. different things, mm -hmm. but it's the basic view. God said, kill him, and it's okay. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go with the, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go with that description instead for the sake of uh, clarity. Yeah. Uh, so this has been the traditional interpretation, it seems, among the Church Fathers, although you did note that... Most, least, most of them, most, or right. at least after a certain point in time. But especially early on, you did have people like Origen and others who were uh, who did take a spiritualizing approach, where they basically ignored the literal sense and said, this is the literal, whatever's going on here literally is too disturbing, so what lesson can we learn from this? And that's what they focused on. Um, and it wasn't just origin. This was a, a, a common thing, actually, among many of the church fathers. But at a certain point in history, certainly by the, the, the early Middle Ages, um, you had a, a resurgence of an awareness of we've got to take the literal sense seriously and we can't just ignore it and and that helped cause a resurgence of the kill them all but it's okay because god said so view and so aside from origin who else could we uh, put into this camp i've heard some people say gregory of nyssa yes yeah, possible i would think clement of alexandria too i'd have okay. to do some checking to see the views of individual fathers but based on their known proclivities i i would I, I would think like someone like Clement of Alexandria would would likely be of this view. Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned a, a little bit about the magisterium. Not that the mm -hmm. magisterium has issued any like dogma or oh, the magisterium that. hasn't taught anything <laughs> about about these passages and how to take them. Right, um, but it has allowed the pontifical biblical commission mm -hmm. to say certain positions that a Catholic could take mm -hmm. on these issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's also allowed Thomas Aquinas's view, which is the mm -hmm. kill them all, but it's okay view. Yeah. Um, the So the magisterium permits a range of views. I think the magisterium is more comfortable with the second view today. The magisterium is more comfortable with the second view compared to the first which is why they, I, I think they prefer what the Pontifical Biblical Commission said to what, to what Aquinas said. Mm -hmm. And then I haven't really seen um, anyone, and it may be there, I just haven't, I, I think Matthew Ramage may have done some work in this area, but I haven't seen anybody explicitly applying the third, print, the third position to these texts. Um, but I have seen Pope Benedict um, doing something similar, at least articulating principles that would allow you to relocate the inspiration of Scripture to the totality of the Revelation rather than just the words of particular passages. In fact, in his, he, there are some comments he made along those lines, for example, in, um, in his apostolic, post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Verbum Domini, which was the, the document he wrote following up the Synod on the Word of God. And he makes some comments along these lines there, particularly in the section on dark passages of Scripture. He also went a little further in his final book that was published after his death called What is Christianity? In that, he's got a section, and I actually have it, I should have it in front of me, so I'll read it to you. He's talking about um, differences in how Christians, Jews, and Muslims view Scripture. And he's talking in particular about the Christian Scriptures, and he says, within this diversified millennial literature, because the Christian Scriptures were written in over a millennium, there is... 
There is for Christians a further qualitative subdivision, the one between the Old and New Testament. The New Testament, too, is a collection of different books which can be understood only as a whole and in terms of this whole. For Jews, only the Old Testament is Bible. For Christians, however, it is possible to grasp the Old Testament correctly only in terms of the new interpretation that it had in the words and actions of Jesus Christ. The New Testament gives valid witness to this interpretation. The two collections of texts, the Old Testament the Old and the New Testaments, refer to each other in such a way that the New Testament is the interpretive key to the Old Testament. From a Christian perspective, only in terms of the New Testament can we establish what is, last, what is the lasting theological significance of the Old Testament is. For this reason, he says, it is not possible to speak about a verbal inspiration of the Bible. The meaning and the authority of the individual parts are correctly gathered only, and this is emphasized, from the Bible as a whole and in light of Christ's coming. So you can see how he's articulating principles where you could say, okay, if I need to take the whole of the Bible into account to have a correct understanding of these passages in the Old Testament, because Christ essentially completes and reinterprets and tells us the lasting significance of what came before, you can see how saying, okay, maybe the Old Testament incorporated some material that the human author might have believed, but that is ultimately corrected by the revelation that Christ gave us. So you can see how the principles in this passage that Benedict is articulating could be consistent with that third view, even though he's not here talking about these same passages. Yeah, and, um, you know, some people have talked about how even Jesus will talk about, like when he talks about divorce in the New Testament, Jesus kind of looks back at the law of Moses and he says, look, this isn't really ideal, mm -hmm. and God made an accommodation, or he kind of allowed this to happen, but this isn't really what how it was supposed to be. So... Mm -hmm. In a way, Jesus gives us the picture of the whole, and, you know, obviously, one can say that there are elements of truth, or there are valuable things in each of the perspectives, even if you don't ultimately land in one of them, or, yeah, that, or you don't that, land in the other one, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I try to articulate all three for people and yeah. let them make up their own minds. Right. Uh, Jimmy, my last question for you mm -hmm. is, somebody might be worried that your interpretation compromises too much by way of inerrancy. How would you try to uh, deal with that concern? Well, I would say that my view doesn't compromise inerrancy at all. If my view is the second view. I'm trying to articulate what the human author was trying to do, and I'm not saying he was wrong about anything. The th someone of the third position might say that, but I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we have to be sensitive to what is the human author actually trying to communicate. And so I would say that my view is fully consistent with biblical inerrancy. What it's not is a literalistic view, but liter the question of do you take a passage literalistically or do you, do you recognize some other sense is a separate issue than infallibility. It's like in the book of Revelation, you know, it talks about the devil as a big red flying dragon with seven heads. Well, guess what? The devil's an angel, so he doesn't have a body, so he's not literally a big red dragon flying around with seven heads. Um, that would be a literalistic understanding of the text, meaning so, a, a, an understanding that takes the text in a word-for-word, -word, woodenly literal way. And we're not meant to do that with Scripture. We need to understand what the biblical author was intending. John was not attempting to tell us the devil is literally a flying red dragon with seven heads that might show up in the, in the sequel to Godzilla versus Ghidorah. Um, so in the same way, we have to ask the question, what was the author of Deuteronomy and what was the author of Joshua? actually trying to communicate to his audience, um, and we shouldn't read literalistically. If we did, then guess what? God's got a really long nose, 
because one of the one of, you frequently read in the Old Testament, they don't translate it this way in English, but in the Old Testament, it frequently talks about how long God's nose is and how what a great thing that is that God has this long nose, because in Hebrew, long nose is an idiom. It's like our English roll out the red carpet. Uh, we don't literally mean roll out a red carpet when we say, oh, there's an important person coming, we need to roll out the red carpet. Well, the Hebrews didn't literally think God had, a, at least most of them, at least the educated ones, didn't think God literally had a long nose. That's a Hebrew idiom for being patient. You're long of nose if you are a patient person. And so they'll talk about how God's long of nose. But if you read that literalistically, you'd think, you know, God's got a big, huge schnoz that's bigger than Jimmy Durante's. All right, Jimmy, I want to thank you for this. And um, do, you, are you, do you have some time to take questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank Michoville for the um, super chat. I'm very thankful for it, and uh, I really appreciate it. All right, Jimmy, one of the questions that I saw in the chat was, so somebody had a question about, you know, why should we cite origin at all? And Anthony had this Mm -hmm. um, kind of secondary comment where Anthony said, my understanding is that some of Origen's writings were condemned, but not everything he wrote full stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, he believes some things that were definitely correct. We're obviously not condemning that. So just maybe clarifying when you use Origen, how much what should people read in or not read into what you're doing? Well, Origen is an interesting case. Um, I'm using him as an as a representative of what was believed in some early Christian circles. And Origen was considered orthodox in his own day. That's one of the things you don't do when you're, um, when you're uh, evaluating someone's orthodoxy status. You don't judge them by the standards of a later day. Like, for example, if you did that, you'd have to ditch everything Thomas Aquinas wrote because he didn't believe in the Immaculate Conception the way the church has now articulated it. You judge people in terms of what was accepted Christian teaching in their own day. And in Origen's day, things were, were what Origen said was, you know, within the pale. Later, he, after his time, he got some criticism. After he was already safely dead, he got some criticism. And that led to some councils making, uh, apparently, there's actually a, some doubt about this, but it led to some councils making uh, some nasty remarks about him. But even if even if some of his opinions were wrong, that doesn't stop him from being valuable in as a witness to what other Christians believe. And it doesn't stop him from being right. Uh, this isn't a, f- a f- you know, falsum in, uh, falsus in unibus, falsum in omnibus situation, um, where if he's got to be wrong, if he's wrong about one thing, that means he's wrong about everything. And that doesn't follow at all. In fact, Origen is, seems to recently being, uh, seems to be undergoing a kind of rehabilitation. Um, he's classically been excluded from the ranks of the church fathers, but Benedict the Sixteenth had a lot of things that to say about Origen that were high praise. I mean, he refers to him at one point as a spiritual master, and or something like that. And he twice refers to Origen as a church father. So Origen seems to be getting a bit of a reevaluation. But uh, to give an instructive parallel, and I'm pretty sure Origen's quoted in the Catechism, but someone I know that's quoted in the Catechism is Tertullian, and he's the other church father who was never actually a church father because he had sympathies to the Montanist movement, and especially later in his career. And so Tertullian has never been considered a church father, but he is an extremely important witness to, in the main, to Orthodox Christendom in the early third century, and he even gets quoted in the uh, in the Catechism. So just because some just because someone was mistaken on some points doesn't mean they're that you can't read them and benefit from considering what they had to say. Yeah, sorry, there were internet connection mm-hmm. issues again. Sure. Um, but you were talking about basically Tertullian and how even he is often cited. 
Yeah. Um, so just to recap, in case some of it didn't come through, you know, Tertullian is a problematic individual. He's not a church father, but he gets quoted regularly by scholars, including the authors of the Catechism, because he's an important witness to what many Christians did believe in that day. And he, he makes some points that are a- actually correct. All right. Um, another question that was asked was, so I guess this is, I'm just going to say basketball, but I'm sure mm-hmm. th- I'm missing some syllables. But anyway, um, he just asked, just watch the Prince of Egypt movie, got me thinking about Exodus and the plagues of Egypt. Is this event historical, including the deaths of all firstborn sons? Well, people are going to have different opinions about this. Some people are going to say it's fully literal. Everything happened exactly this way. Other people are going to say, no, nah, nothing like this happened. The Exodus itself didn't exist. You know, the biblical minimalists I mentioned. Other people are going to be in the middle, and I tend to be in this category. I, I say I think the Exodus did happen, but I think in this part of Scripture— it's far enough in the past from when the author is writing, because I think this is written around you know, the United Monarchy, and it's describing events at least a couple hundred years earlier. I think, I think it's been stylized. And so I, if, I, if, if I hopped in my TARDIS and went back to actually watch it, I think I'd see it play out a little differently, but the substance um, – is uh, is 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 accurate. In fact, I'd I'd recommend that basketball check out the episode of Mysterious of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World that I did on the Exodus because I talk about this issue and it's been pointed out that except for the death of the firstborn, which seems to have another basis because it, the Pharaoh. It's, I don't actually talk about this in the I don't think in the episode, but the Pharaoh of the Exodus is almost certainly Ramesses the second. And Ramesses II's firstborn did die. Um, so that may be part of what's behind the 10th plague. But for the first nine nine plagues, they actually are things that occur in Egypt as part of its normal agricultural cycle. And, it, and so what very well may have happened was at the time of the Exodus, there was a year where these problems with the agricultural cycle were unusually severe. And Moses said correctly, this is God's doing, let us out of here. So so I don't dismiss the the historicity of the plagues, um, especially given how closely the first nine of them actually follow events that we know happen in Egypt. Um, But I would, uh, my sense would be that there is a degree of, of, stylization and uh, reconstruction in how they're being presented in the text because of how late it was written. I think there's I, th- I think it, you could kind of graph the degree of precision with which a text is written based on how long after the events it was written and when in Israel's history it was written. Once you get the United Monarchy, you have record keepers. They're keeping track of what the king is doing. They're putting it in the archives. And then later biblical authors can go to those archives, pull the records, and read about a king. So you're going to have quite precise information about the kings. And we even see, like in books like Chronicles, it'll say, for more information on this, go read in the annals. You know, So we know they were using annals to record what the kings were doing. I think we achieve a high degree of precision from the United Monarchy onward. But before that, they didn't have records of exactly what happened and when it happened. So they had to use more reconstruction to, and like the core of the story will be accurate, but they're having to reconstruct a lot of the details for things that happened before they had records. All right, Jimmy, I just have two more questions for you. I know uh-huh. that there were more questions in the chat, but a lot of them were actually answered in the course of the uh, interview. So I would just recommend going back. Like some people asked about the church fathers, and we covered that. Mm-hmm. And also, I think you said you wanted to maybe look back and just see certain exact citations. So that's something that we can like save for another time or even just going back and rewinding the tape. Um, Colin Gordon asked... If after 2,000 years we just now, quote-unquote, reinterpret the literal sense of the passage differently, 
where is the limiting principle? So reinterpret mm-hmm. the Ten Commandments, uh, homosexuality, other issues. What's your take on this question, Jimmy? Well, um, the so we're dealing with there are limiting principles, but the if we're asking. What's the best way to put this? The goal of biblical scholarship has always been to understand what is the human author trying to communicate. And the goal of it has never been just read the words and affirm that they that they mean exactly what they say. If that was the case, then God would have a long nose and God would have feathers and God would have wings because there are passages that talk about all God having all those things. Every human language incorporates non-literal elements. And so the question has never been, how far should we go from the literal? The question has always been, what is the human author trying to say? And so, um, so that's the limiting principle. You, if we get better information about what the human author was trying to say, then we better know. We, or I should say, we know better what the human author was trying to say. We, we, the goal is not to cling to a literalistic interpretation of the words. It has always been to accurately assess the human author's meaning. So if we gain new information about, for example, how ancient Near Eastern literature worked, then we should incorporate that. Um, Do I think that we're going to reinterpret the Ten Commandments or the New Testament's passages dealing with homosexuality? No, I don't think we should. Uh, And I don't think we're going to get evidence that would suggest that we should. But the but we're thinking about the issue incorrectly if we're framing it in terms of how far away from a literalistic reading can we get. That's 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 not the goal. Yeah. Um basketball, I just want to thank you for the super chat and also mm-hmm. Anthony, thank you for the super chat. I I'm very thankful for you guys and uh yeah, I mean, it means a lot, especially because this is such a difficult subject. So I kind of thought people are just going to be upset, but I'm actually very amazed at how well everyone's, t- you know, embracing and listening to Jimmy. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I, mean, I am too, again, even I, though I can't see it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I t- I've told my audience before that they're some of the best, they're like my favorite audience online, because a lot of them are just so, you know, they, they, they try their best to listen and um, they tr- they take seriously scholars, and but they also are very serious about the faith. And so I, I think I have the best YouTube audience. Uh, of course, well, I would have to Catholic disagree Asian. with that. I'd have to <laughs> disagree right, with right. that, but <laughs> that's right. They're both equally great. Okay. I like that. I like that. That's good. All right. Storyteller 0111 asked Would Jimmy agree that the claim God's nature is the good doesn't answer the worry behind Euthyphro's dilemma because it can be interpreted in two ways as a definition of the good or as a substantial claim about God's nature. Well, I think that all one has to do is um, specify which of the senses you mean. And, um, and if you, if, if you specify it to mean the first that, that, uh, it's just it provides a de- God's nature provides a definition of the good. In an, can you back up to so I can see his uh, exactly how he phrased it? Yeah. So um, so if if you mean whatever God's, I think the fundamental answer is you just need to specify what you mean by the claim. And if you say that God's nature is love, and therefore that's why we need to love God and love our neighbor, then it does answer the Euthyphro dilemma. On the other hand, if you say, oh, whatever God names as good must be part of his nature, so it's not a substantive claim about his nature that's rooted in love, or if you want to say torturing innocent babies is loving if God commands it, um, then I think that it it is 
it, it doesn't answer the youth of our dilemma. But I don't think that's how people who use this argument intend it. I don't think they're trying to justify a anything God says is good approach by appealing to his nature. When they appeal to his nature, they are explicitly rejecting the the horn of the Euthyphro dilemma that says something is good because the gods command it. I mean, simply because the gods command it. Um, and so I think that that would be a misreading of the way people who use the God's nature argument are actually using it. Yeah, and I just want to echo what you said and kind of what I was trying to get at earlier, mm -hmm. which is we want to be able to say, though, with a coherent picture what God would command or at least mm -hmm. what the divine nature would not do. Yeah. We want to be able to have a coherent picture. We have to be careful about we have to be careful about that because God's ways are higher than our ways, so we've got to be a little sophisticated in our approach. But I think fundamentally, right. you can say, based on his nature, there are certain things God wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Like lie, for example. That's one the New Testament mentions. Right. Well, Jimmy, it's been a blast talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I think you're one of, I mean, you're, you're clearly, I mean, you're just so good. And I really appreciate the specificity <laughs> The sophistication you bring to these conversations. Wi-Fi. Here goes my Wi-Fi. Sorry oh, about that. Um, well, I was in the middle of saying something very nice. <laughs> well, it's probably good I didn't hear it then. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, you're great, and I enjoy talking to you, and I'm very thankful for what you do. Thank you. Likewise, and happy Easter to you and your entire audience. Yes, happy Easter. He's risen.